Well, as I mentioned, our mission statement says, our mission is to glorify God by multiplying mature disciples in healthy churches that, and the highlighted words are, know Jesus Christ and make him known. I wanted that to be a theme for us this year, a focus. You might have heard that before. It sounds familiar. Other organizations like the Navigators have used that particular phrase as their mission, and it's a part of our mission. And I I want us to think about that last phrase because I really think it's what we need to focus on and what we probably think we already know and do, but I think we could do more excellently. And so to direct our attention to how we might know Jesus Christ more intimately and make him known more joyfully, I want you to look with me to Psalm 23, verse 1. And I want to first look at this idea of knowing Jesus Christ. Because honestly, I think sometimes we think we know someone, but we don't really know them like we think we do. You you know what I'm saying? It's like the, the guy that had this family rule, and he told his family, look, Go to the bathroom before the church service starts because we're never, ever, ever going to get up and walk out of the church service to go to the bathroom. That, that is a family rule, and you will never violate it. Okay, so he and his wife and kids all sat in one of the rows, and he was sitting there, and he goes, oh, no. Oh, no. And so he thought, oh, I'm going to be in trouble. But he, had, he got up, and he went to the bathroom. And he came back in, and he slipped down the aisle, and he sat down, and he could just tell she wasn't happy. And so he, oh, he, he, she, he was getting the cold shoulder. And so he kind of reached over and tried to put his leg up against her leg. And she pulled away. And then he, he put his arm around her. And she elbowed him in the ribs. And all of a sudden he looked over and it wasn't his wife. <laughs> she was sitting row behind (laughs) oh he thought he knew her I, I think there's a lot of people who say they know Jesus but I wonder if they really do I think there's a lot of people that sought to know Jesus for a period of time and then got comfortable and kind of said you know this is good enough and they've not continued seeking to know him, professing to know Jesus intimately, but it's not showing up in their daily lives. King David was a guy like that. You might remember parts of his life where he was even called a man after God's own heart, and yet he would go out and do something just blatantly anti-God. He blew it right and left. He messed up with his children. He messed up with his wives, plural. He, he really messed up with Bathsheba. And he did all those things, and yet, at the end of his life, you could honestly say, he knew God. He knew him well. And so he writes Psalm 23 as an old king looking back on his life, realizing how faithful God had been to him. And he uses a metaphor that we sometimes have a hard time understanding unless you've been raised in the country or you've been raised on a ranch. You don't necessarily understand the metaphor of a sheep and shepherd. But the Bible calls us sheep over 200 times. You know what sheep are like? To admit you're a sheep is pretty humbling. They're stupid. They can't even clean themselves. They will follow anything and jump right off a cliff. I mean, they're, they're just really a mess. So what do sheep need more than anything in the world? A shepherd. And so God gives this analogy, this metaphor, throughout the Old and New Testament of his people being sheep, and he is the ultimate shepherd, and then he gets these other shepherds to work under him to protect and provide for and everything for the sheep. And David says, there was a time in my life when I was a shepherd of actual sheep. Then as king, I became a shepherd of people and a nation. But now that I'm an old man, 
I'm still just a sheep. I still need a shepherd. And it's a beautiful picture he gives us here of being a sheep and having the Lord as our shepherd. He begins this psalm with a proclamation, and that's what verse 1 really is. Every commentator you read will point this out. It's almost like he's shouting this for the world to hear. He is so excited about this fact that he, he's saying, hey, hey, check this out. Are, are you all listening? The Lord is my shepherd. Hey, do you believe that? Can you believe that? The Lord is my shepherd. Oh, he's blown away by that concept. And as he describes this, so many things flow out of this that are just life-changing, or at least they ought to be. Now, would you agree with me that this is the most well-known verse or book in, or chapter in the entire Old Testament? And maybe next to John 3.16, which got a little extra promo at football games, they, they, uh, it, it, they're, they're right neck and neck as well-known. Most of you could quote this. Do you know that secular people almost always request this be read at funerals? They don't even know him. But somehow these verses mean so much. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Well, to understand that phrase, you have to understand it in the middle of a trilogy. Because when David wrote this, he wrote Psalm 22, 23, and 24, I believe is a trilogy. And Psalm 22 is the beginning, Psalm 23 the middle, Psalm 24 the end. In Psalm 22, you have past redemption. You have the Messiah coming and suffering and dying on a cross. By the way, we have described hundreds of years before crucifixion was invented. That's prophecy. The Messiah is going to suffer and die on a cross. He's going to be buried. He's going to rise from the dead. He's going to conquer sin and death to be your Savior. And that concept would be the idea of the good shepherd. The good shepherd. In John 10, 11, Jesus said these words, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The good shepherd dying in our place, being a sacrificial substitute, experiencing the wrath of God so we would never have to. The good shepherd not, not going to run away when the going gets tough. He's going to protect the sheep at all costs, and he's going to actually pay the redemption price for them to be delivered. Psalm 23, then, present redemption. He's the shepherd. He is literally the great shepherd. And Hebrews 13 talks about that. The God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, May he equip you in every good thing to do his will. In other words, that one who died in your place and rose from the dead is now presently working in and through your life. Or as Paul could say in Galatians 2.20, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. This shepherd is present now. He's with me everywhere I go. He is empowering me. He is directing me. He is guiding me. He is loving me. And so that's what Psalm 23 is about. Psalm 24 is future redemption. It's when the sovereign shepherd returns, or you call him the chief shepherd. 1 Peter 5, 4, in talking about reward someday, says, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. So you have the good shepherd who dies for you, the great shepherd who leads and guides and strengthens and empowers you, and the chief shepherd who's coming back someday to take you into his eternal kingdom where you will live with him forever and ever and ever. Amen. Isn't that great news? No wonder David's excited. So David understands that context. He's the author of all of these. And so he's looking at this verse with the understanding of Psalm 22. The reason I can say the Lord is my shepherd is because he purchased me. He died in my place. Now, I want to submit something for you to think about. I believe most Christians in America today know Jesus quite well as Savior. I believe most Christians in the world today know Jesus quite well as sovereign coming king, and they look forward to that day. I think where they struggle is in the middle. 
I think most Christians struggle with that day-to-day walk with Jesus as their shepherd. Is he really leading? Is he guiding? Is he there? What does he want me to do? Will he empower me to do it? Am I going to survive this? And, and we start acting like we don't even have a shepherd. Do you understand? What, anybody here know what I'm talking about? You might be characterized by fear, worry, anxiety, depression, discouragement, all those kinds of things. David writes with that in mind. Say, what do you mean? More than likely at this point in his life, it was when he was an old man and his son Absalom had kicked him out of Jerusalem and taken over the throne. He's wandering around in caves and hiding because his son is sending people out to kill him. He's looking back over his life. Would you think that experiencing that might be kind of a dark time in your life? You're rejected by your son who wants to take over, wants you dead. And in the quietness of those dark days, walking through the valley of the shadow of death, he's able to say, the Lord is my what? Shepherd. I shall not want That's an amazing statement. I want to break that down for you, just word by word, and let's see what we can bring from this that might encourage us as we go forward this year to know Jesus Christ and make him known. I earnestly want all of us to know him more intimately as our shepherd to walk with him, to follow him, to experience his grace and his peace, his leading, his kindness, his truth, his provision. That's what I want for all of us. Is that a great goal? Not just talking about it, have it be real. And so real that people are gonna go, hey, what's going on with you? You're going through all the same problems I'm going through, but you seem to just be cruising. What is going on? And you can say, oh, Let me tell you, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Let's start off with the Lord. That's an inclusio, by the way. That's a a term that people who write describe when you have a parenthesis. You have something at the beginning and something at the end with everything in the middle. That beginning and ending is the primary focal point. Everything in the middle supports that. So the focus of this psalm is the Lord. It's not David and his problems. David and his problems are overcome because of the Lord. And so he says, the Lord. Now, notice he's not saying a Lord. Are there a lot of so-called Lords out there? Are there a lot of people that are claiming that they can solve your problems and meet your needs and take care of everything you're facing? Is it true or not? And they're all, they're all over the place. There's all these Lords out there, but Jesus is the Lord, the one and only. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the absolute monarch, the sovereign, the the creator, the sustainer. Everything else is submissive to him. Nobody has authority unless he grants it to them, and he can take it away at any time. Why in the world would we follow anyone else? David says, that one, creator, sustainer. You say, what is the Lord? What is that? Well, it's the name Yahweh. It's the Hebrew word. It's four consonants, Y-H-W-H. Yahweh. You know that that name is never used by any other God in the world? There's all kinds of people who have names for their different gods. Yahweh is only used of the God of Israel. He's the only one. What does it mean? He says it to Moses in Exodus 3.14. Moses says, who shall I say sent me? I am that I am. Say what? I am. What do you mean by that? I am. I am eternal existent. I have always been and I always will be. I am completely self-sufficient. I don't need anyone or anything. I have more than enough to meet every one of your needs. Anything and everything you could ever possibly need ever, I am perfectly capable of meeting that for you. You don't need anyone else. You need me. You are not the I am. You are a created being. You are finite. You are limited. You cannot supply the things that you need, but oh, I can. I am the I am. 
I have been, am now, and always will be. And by the way, that name as we saw, the I am of the Old Testament, Jesus takes that moniker up and calls himself the I am. Jesus says, I am Yahweh God. I am not just a man, I am the God man. I am the Messiah. I am the Savior of Israel, the Savior of the world. I am that sacrificial substitute who died for you in Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53. I am the one who's going to be coming soon as King of kings and Lord of lords. I'm the first and the last, the beginning and the end. I am the Lord. And then, and then David goes from that. So he said, okay, this risen God, this God of gods, the only true God, what's the next word? Is. That's a critical word. You say, Paul, why is that so important? Well, it's not just was. Was he the Lord? Yeah, but he still is. It's not that he might be, he is. He is the ever-present great I am. He is David's Lord. David is able to say that not just in the past, but in the present, in the moment. What he is facing right there because of Psalm 22, because of the cross, right now, everything I am facing, he is Lord. Does that encourage you? Wow, I think about that and I just get so excited. He's never going to stop being my Lord. When I embrace Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, the new covenant began in me and the Spirit of God was placed in me and I am and forever will be his child. How about you? Is anything ever going to change that? So I can keep on saying in the moment the Lord is my shepherd. Well, why is the word my so important? Because it's personal. Is the Lord your shepherd? We know he's a shepherd. We know he's a great shepherd, the chief shepherd, the good shepherd, but is he your shepherd? David is able to say, he's my shepherd. David is able to say, I'm forgiven. I've been made right with God. I've received his forgiveness. And notice how personal it is. All through the rest of the psalm, here's the, the pronouns. My, I, me, me, my, me, I, I, me, 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 my, 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 me, my, I. You see anything consistent with that? This is personal. David's going, I'm not talking about someone else over there. I'm not talking about Moses. I'm not talking about Abraham. I'm talking about me. I have a personal relationship with the Lord God of the universe. Can you say that? He's my shepherd. You know, there's a difference here because most people cannot honestly say that. Most people, if they were honest about their shepherd, their shepherd would be money, power, security, or Satan. But it wouldn't be the Lord. How sad. Are those other things worth your devotion? Are they worth following? Is it worth it to sacrifice your life and gain the whole world and forfeit your soul? Of course not. But that's the deception there's a difference between knowledge and appropriation of knowledge. Remember when Job and his wife lost their children? And this tragic day came through and all the kids were wiped out? A servant could say, the children are dead. Job and his wife would say, our children are dead. Is there a difference between those two? That's what David's saying here. This is not theoretical. This is not in some pie in the sky situation down the road someday after Jesus comes back. Right now in exile, hiding in a cave with my life on the line, the Lord is my shepherd. My shepherd. Shepherd. I found this fascinating. The Hebrew word here is not a noun, it's a verb. <laughs> How is it that you're a shepherd? By virtue of what you do. You catch that? It's a verb. He's our shepherd. He is the one who shepherds us. It's not just who he is, it's what he does. What does a shepherd do? He feeds you, he leads you, he guides you, he protects you, he disciplines you, restores you, prepares you, anoints you, and he's with you. He is there with you. He lays down his life for you. And when David is saying this, the Lord is my shepherd, he is saying, I want the Lord in the right place in my life. 
I want him calling the shots. I want to follow his lead. I want to do things his way. I want to go where he wants me to go. I want to eat what he wants me to eat. I want to bah when he wants me to bah, right? That's what I want because that's what is the rightful place for the Lord in my life. Am I making sense? Is that true of us? Or could we excel still more? Could it be more obvious to the world that the Lord is our shepherd and that we're following him? We're not questioning him. We're not challenging him. Just say, Lord, just tell me what you want. And that's what I want. Because that's your rightful place in my life. Do you understand what sin was? Sin was saying, no, I'm going to do it my way. I want to do it my way. All we like sheep have gone. Each of us has turned to that's sin. I'm going to do it my way. Makes a nice song, but it's not true. I did it my way. This is a man who says, you know, I'm tired of doing it my way. I've screwed up my life. I've screwed up the kingdom. I've screwed up my marriages. I've screwed up my children. Now I want to do it your way. I want you to be Lord. I want you to be my shepherd. John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. You know, there's a lot of sheep out there that will hear the voice of a shepherd, but only the sheep that belong to that shepherd follow him. Jesus has sounded his message out loud and clear throughout through the whole world, but only his sheep follow. Are you a sheep? Is he your shepherd? Are you following? Whatever you are following, is it worth the sacrifice? I mean, if you're engaged in some other stuff and you're trusting in drugs and money and power and sex and positions and all of that kind of stuff, is that really going to carry you through? I say there's only one Lord who's worthy of following. And David is saying, hey, check it out. Look who my shepherd is. And because of who he is, I shall not want. Now, I didn't understand that as a kid. Did any of you hear this verse as a child? You heard this when you were young? I heard that, and it was kind of like that long letter in the alphabet song, Elemento. Remember that? When you're singing the alphabet song, and there was this one long letter called Elemento. And I, and I, I, I was going, what do, you, what do you mean? The Lord is my shepherd, and I don't want him. That didn't make any sense to me. Can you read it that way? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want him. That's not what it says. What is it saying? I shall not want. I, personal David learned this over time. By the way, was this always the case for David? Did David ever struggle with lack of contentment? Quite frequently. Read the Psalms. Most of the Psalms, by the way, are lament Psalms. They are honest Psalms where somebody's crying out, this isn't fair, I don't like this, life is miserable, I don't understand why, and then somehow the psalmist sees God in its right perspective and there's a resolve to the problem. David wrote most of those. He understood. He understood what it was when he wasn't content, when he had to have more, when he wanted something to make him feel better about himself. But he changed. He could say, no, I personally don't need anything other than what he's given me. I'm perfectly content. Notice how he says it. I love this. I shall not want. What do you mean shall? Not now or ever in the future. Can you say that? Right now, not knowing what's going to happen tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, not knowing if there's going to be another virus coming through or if you're going to get fired or if your house is going to burn down or someone's going to leave you, can you say honestly, because the Lord is in my life, if everything else is stripped to me, I'm okay. In fact, I'm not okay, I'm thriving. Can you say that? You can if he's your shepherd, because he will provide everything you need. And my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus, Paul says in Philippians 4.19. Amen? Notice he didn't say, and my God shall supply all your greeds. No, 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 it's needs. And that's exactly what he's talking about here. I love the fact that he says, I, sh- I shall not want. What he's declaring here is a full escalation war on anxiety and fear. Now, friends, I'm telling you, our society is being torn apart by anxiety and fear and depression and worry. Have you noticed? 
the anxiety attacks, the psychiatrists and psychologists' offices are being overwhelmed because people don't have a shepherd. They don't have a shepherd who will meet their every need. Oh, what a difference this makes to approach every single day and all my tomorrows saying, I'm going to live in the present. And in this moment, God's going to take care of me. Have any of you ever laid awake at night worrying about tomorrow, next week, a future conversation you have to have with someone, an argument that took place, and you know you got to keep it up the next day? Anyway, just be honest, just for a second. Come on, be honest, would you? Anybody ever have that struggle? David's saying, not me. Not anymore. No, I, I, I know my shepherd. He's taken me through so many things. And I not only trust him today, I will trust him tomorrow and next week and next month and next year until I see him face to face. I shall not want. I shall never lack. I shall never be deficient. I will never lack proper care or management. My shepherd will never fail me. I am content knowing that he is the best shepherd in the history of the universe and he will never be derelict in his duty. He will take care of me all the time. Every situation, every circumstance is under his control. He is orchestrating details like crazy. He is moving and managing. Right now, for some of you who are single, he's preparing some other person for you. Someday down the road, if the Lord has marriage for you, he is preparing another person for you. And they're going through exactly what they need to go through to be able to put up with you. It's unbelievable. <laughs> All of this the Lord is doing, and he's providentially working all of this out for your good and his glory so that you will never lack. So you can be content. Like Paul was in Philippians 4. The shepherd is Jesus. He was with Israel in the Old Testament, 1 Corinthians 10 says. He comes on the scene as a baby, and his name is Emmanuel, God with us. At the end of his ministry in Matthew 28, he says, And lo, I am with you always. I will continue to shepherd you every moment of every day until you're in my eternal kingdom. And then, by the way, he will shepherd in the kingdom. And he will never not do it right because all through the Old Testament, when all the other shepherds failed, he pointed that out again and again and again. He called the derelict shepherds to task and he pointed out how wrong they were for not giving themselves to the sheep. They were selfish. They were taking the money for themselves. They were taking the glory for themselves, and he's saying, no, 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 I will become your shepherd because they've all screwed up. You can read that in Jeremiah 23 and Ezekiel and so many other places. No, 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 your shepherd, my shepherd will always be there, and he will never fail to give me exactly what I need in the moment I need it. Not typically too much before then, right? So when I need it, it's there. His grace will be sufficient. Oh, do you know him that way? Could you know him better? Could you follow him more closely? Well, if we know him, then just real quickly, then we can make him known. But notice how those two go together. If you don't know something very well, you have a hard time explaining it to someone else. The more I know him as my shepherd, the more I can talk to anybody, no matter what they're facing, no matter what their background, no matter what their challenge, no matter what mental pressure and financial pressure and relational pressure they're under, it does not matter. The answer is still the same. Oh, you need Jesus as your shepherd. Oh, how you need that. I came across a quote, a friend of mine, Todd Smith, a pastor in Santa Clarita, wrote a book called Dark Valleys on Psalm 23, and he quotes do psychologist Dr. Richard Leahy, who said this, the average high school kid today has the same level of, of anxiety as the average psychiatric patient in the early 1950s. You catch that? That is now the norm. People that were freaking out in the 1950s, that's average fare for the teenagers of today. Oh, man, they need help. Alistair Begg quoted a poem. I'm not, not sure what the source is, but I remember him quoting this. Said the robin to the sparrow, I should really like to know why these restless human beings rush around and worry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, oh, I think that it must be that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. The birds of the field know the shepherding care of God so often better than we do. 
Jesus comes along in Matthew 9, ministering to the most religious people on the planet, and says, he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. Being religious isn't the answer. We need a relationship. We need to know the shepherd. We need to receive what he did for us in Psalm 22. We need to experience his grace in our lives as he leads us and changes us, calls us and woos us, disciplines us when necessary, but takes care of everything in our lives that we might know and love and serve him with a whole heart. There's the connection. The world says you need self-help. The Bible says you need a savior, you need a shepherd. Well, how does that impact us telling others about Jesus? If you know somebody and you love somebody, is it easier to talk about them? A young man at a diamond store was trying to sell a diamond to a young couple engaged, and he knew everything about the diamond. He knew the clarity and the color and the cut and all that, and he's explaining all the details of all that. And the couple looked at the diamond and said, hmm, thank you very much, and started to walk out. The manager of the store said, oh, excuse me, folks, can, can you come back here for a second? And he told them about that diamond. They bought it and walked out. The young man said to the manager, I told them everything that they could possibly want to know about that diamond. Why did they buy it from you and not from me? He said, because you know about diamonds but I love diamonds. If Jesus shepherds you every moment of every day, through every trial and every tribulation, oh, how you come to love him and you know him, his character, his faithfulness. Oh, it's so much easier to talk about someone like that, isn't it? Do you know him that way? Could you maybe this year, like I'm going to try to do, commit more time to getting to know him, listening to him speak through his word, praying to him, bringing him everything in prayer, gathering with other like-minded believers and hearing the stories of what he's doing in their lives and having that be encouragement so that you could be built up in him and then go out and get to know your neighbors and your co-workers and fellow students and some of your relatives and others and see them with compassion. Even people of opposing political parties and say, you know what? There's a sheep without a shepherd and I have the answer they need is Jesus. Amen? That will be the business of this church this year. And with that said, our business meeting has now come to a close. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of being able to shout out for the whole world to hear, the Lord Jesus is my shepherd, and I have no wants. I'm perfectly content. I'm taken care of both now and into eternity. Oh, Father, if there's anybody here that can't say that, that they have not truly surrendered their life to Jesus, how I pray that you'd empower them to do that even now. That they would trust in Jesus, not themselves, not religion. They would, re would realize he died for them. He rose from the dead. He ascended, he's coming back. And he paid the price in full. Help us all, Lord, to understand that more and to walk closer to you, to experience your grace, and then to make it known to as many as possible. We ask that for your glory and honor in the matchless name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen.